I'm Phil Rickaby, and I've been a writer and performer for almost 30 years. But I've realized that I don't really know as much as I should about the theater scene outside of my particular Toronto bubble. Now, I'm on a quest to learn as much as I can about the theater scene across Canada. So join me as I talk with mainstream theater creators you may have heard of, and indie artists you really should know, as we find out just what it takes to be stage-worthy. If you value the work that I do on Stageworthy, please consider leaving a donation either as a one-time thing or on a recurring monthly basis. Stageworthy is created entirely by me, and I give it to you free of charge with no advertising or other sponsored messages. Your continuing support helps me to cover the cost of producing and distributing the show. Just four people donating $5 a month would help me cover the cost of podcast hosting alone. Help me continue to bring you this podcast. You can find a link to donate in the show notes, which you can find in your podcast app or at the website at stageworthy.ca. Now, on to the show. Vishesh Abharatne is a Sri Lankan Canadian playwright and dramaturg who divides his time between Ottawa and Montreal. He joined me to talk about his play, Blood Offering, which is being presented as a workshop performance at York University, presented by Alma Mater's Productions. Here's our conversation. Vishesh, thank you uh, so much for, for joining me. The, probably the best place for us to start today is to just talk about Blood Offering and, and, and what, what, it, what it is. Yeah, so uh, Blood Offering is a play that I've been working on for uh, a few years now. I started writing a, I started writing it in 2018, and uh, it was just a short 10-minute piece when I began working on it. Uh, but then I, uh, years later, when I uh, came back to Ottawa from Victoria, I came back just in time for the pandemic, and uh, I got a, an opportunity to develop it further um, when I became a playwright in residence at the Great Canadian Theatre Company. And uh, so I developed it further into, into a kind of a longer uh, one act play. And um, what really began it, well, I can tell you a little bit about, um, I can tell you a little bit about what it's about. Uh, it's set in the United States and it takes place after um, yet another mass shooting has taken place at, uh, at a mall resulting in the death of a young girl. And, uh, this all takes place before the play begins and the play focuses on um, her, different members of the community that have been affected by her murder. Um, her teacher, Mr. Nakvi, who is a uh, Pakistani American. Um, he's known her for a long, he's known her for a long time. Uh, there's also her friend Farid who uh, they, who had a bit of a, they who had a bit of an unrequited uh, crush on her and never got to tell her before she died. And so the play kind of opens with them sort of bonding over their shared loss. And um, then things get complicated when her parents enter the picture because they have um, in the wake of her death, they have been campaigning to, uh, to change the, They've been campaigning to get Republican politicians to change the gun laws and to add some new ones to sort of make it harder for people to access firearms and, and military grade assault rifles and all kinds of uh, other kinds of weapons that uh, people don't actually need. And of course, that's resulted in radio silence from their representatives. And so they come up with a plan to essentially recruit Farid to carry out another mass shooting at uh at Kayla's school so that Republicans will finally be scared into uh they'll finally they'll finally be scared into sort of passing gun control laws that will uh, prevent people from accessing firearms and by people in, in this case of course I mean people of color brown people um it's sort of I sort of got this idea after uh, in 2018, after I think hearing about yet another mass shooting and then doing a little bit of research, 
and finding out that, um, and this is actually discussed in the play as well, finding out about um, a piece of legislation that was enacted in, uh, I believe it was the 70s, um, called the Mulford Act. It was passed in California, Reagan signed it into law, and essentially it was it was written and passed in response to the Black Panthers trying to basically follow cops around and making sure that they didn't kill or injure any more black American citizens. And so it was one, it was one of the few times that the NRA actually acted in support of gun control, which I found really interesting um, because it revealed a very kind of disturbing uh, double standard at the heart of um you know, the way lawmakers determine who does and doesn't have access to guns in America. And it's, and so I sort of, from there, I, I sort of made the conjecture, well, you know, what if, uh, you know, what if a young brown man who was seemingly radicalized, you know, the, a young brown man who was essentially like the stereotypical, image of like the radicalized Muslim went and, and shot up a school. Wouldn't that like, wouldn't that aren't, aren't, you know, <laughs> aren't white American conservatives supposed to be scared of that, of those kind of, of the kinds of people taking over? Like, wouldn't that finally push them into, into protecting, uh, into protecting Americans from gun violence? So uh, I began to sort of extrapolate on that idea and kind of form a dramatic, uh, a, a dramatic through line and a dramatic exploration of like what would actually happen if this idea were uh, put into place. See, I, I actually remember the the story that you're, you're you were talking about about the Black Panthers, and it does it yeah. just like you like you said it reveals the the inherent racism of of the Republicans of the of the NRA uh, of just of, of generally because it's gun control for for other people but not for us white folks. Um, I think the sad thing about uh, a play that, that deals with this topic is that it seems like it will always be relevant. There will always, unfortunately, it seems that there will always have been uh, some form of shooting or gun violence in the U S that is relevant to this, to this particular uh, play. I'm one of the questions that, that, that sort of jumps into my mind is whenever we, as, as, as Canadians are, faced with uh problems that are in the u.s um we often there's sort of a separation because we don't we don't live there um as a as a as a canadian as somebody who lives in canada and and you know works in canada as who's a canadian um what is your draw to address this particular problem in, uh, in a play um just as because of the separation of the 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 you know we have we have gun laws in Canada. Um, we would like to strengthen them a little bit, but you know, we have generally have pretty good gun laws. Um, and so what, what's your draw to address this as a Canadian? Yeah. So I think that, um, I think that even though this, yeah, even though this play is set in America and it deals with a uniquely American problem, I think the logic behind it can be applied to pretty much any, any pressing social problem that is, that has received, you know, continual inaction from lawmakers and politicians and the people who do actually have the power to to change these social conditions. Um, you could apply it to, you know, because essentially what the play is about and what it explores through the character of, of um, the characters of the Gordons, Kayla, the young girl's parents, is what happens when people you know, what happens when people are, uh, go unheard for long enough? What, how, what does it take for somebody to finally become radicalized and resort to incredibly extreme actions seemingly in, in the service of, of, uh, benevolent social ends in this case, ending gun control. So, I mean, here you could apply that to, Oh, you, you could apply it to a bunch of things. You could apply it to uh, the fact that, you know, various indigenous communities don't have, still don't have clean drinking water, for example. Um, you know, what would you like if you were to resort to an extreme situation to fix that problem? What would that be? 
and you know does it ever become acceptable to to does it ever become acceptable to resort to violent ends to do that um i think when you take that when you isolate that question uh it becomes pretty applicable to a lot of different political and social problems uh across the world I think one of the interesting things about that that very situation that you outlined is we've had literally a situation in Canada where indigenous people were blocking uh, a highway, were blocking uh, transportation regarding oil, and uh, a militarized uh, a police force, uh, and I acted to remove them. However, when a white group of people attempted to do the same thing. Uh, across uh, a bridge, uh, the the trade bridge in the U.S., um, no, nothing happened for weeks, and and so again, it sort of like shows the the inherent racism of the system. If the brown people do something, uh, we are going to act quickly, and if the white people do something, we are going to ask nicely or not do anything at all. It's it's a stark reminder of uh, of the kind of thing that you're describing for this play. Yeah, very much. Uh, I think that, um, and it, it's also interesting because I kind of what I what I wanted to do with this play is to kind of shift the to kind of shift the focus of you know of how we look at people, like to get to to sort of get ourselves to look at our reactions to when we see kind of different people becoming radicalized and resorting to extreme violence because the Gordons are who are the people who come up with this nefarious plan are this, you know, nice white suburban middle-class couple, probably the last middle-class couple in, in the world really um, who, and, but they still, they're so wracked with, with grief over the loss of their daughter and they're so exhausted and they're so angry and they're, they're, they've just come to the end of their tether and trying to deal with this problem and trying to get some response to their, to their, to their inquiries and to their concerns that they finally feel like they have no choice. And, you know, hopefully, hopefully some people who see this play, you know, when they, and they see them, they'll be able to, I mean, they'll be able to kind of empathize and hopefully they'll be able to kind of examine their own reactions to, uh, like you said, this, this, the kind of inherent racism of being able to empathize with, you know, white, pro white protesters over protesters or over people of color who are ex resort to these kind of radical actions. Um, and yeah, it's just one, it's just a microcosm of, mm -hmm. of, you know, the way we kind of react to, to larger social movements, really. I would almost suggest that there's another, from what, the way you're describing it, there's another layer of, of 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 racial politics in that the white family asks a brown person to do something terrible, knowing that the end for that brown person is either jail or more likely death. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, their whole plan essentially, you know, their whole plan essentially hinges upon a brown person doing something, doing something horrifically violent and you know, conforming to this, you know, conforming to this stereotype that's persisted in, you know, ever in, you know, ever since 9-11 happened. And, you know, in doing so, it results in not only the death of not only the deaths of many more mm -hmm. innocent children, but it also results in, you know, an, 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 a group of people that's already marginalized being further stigmatized because of this, because of this crime. And so it's also it hopefully it it also kind of examines you know when if you want to be generous and call it you know revolution when a violent revolution happens who are the groups of who are the groups of people that get left out who are the groups of people who get sidelined you know who are the groups of people who become collateral damage uh, in this uh, in these moments of great upheaval. It's a very difficult. It just in terms of uh, 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 I anticipate that when people see this play, they will have very visceral 
reactions to it. Um, and uh, because as you describe it, I have a very visceral reaction to it. And so, and that, and that's, that's, that's just because I think leading down the, the path that, that, that we've just gone in, in, in discussing it, it, it hinges on a white family asking a Brown person to do something that, that, that sort of like, sparks the the inherent racism in the system to hopefully get an end that benefits them and it there's like there's there's so many layers of uh of racism to that so i think that there there will be definite definite reactions to that um in terms of the 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 politics of that are you are you prepared for for i mean i remember just just slight tangent um, in Toronto, uh, 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 last last year, um, uh, 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 the 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 play "As You Like It," which has been remounted by the Mervises as the, uh, the 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 land acknowledgement or "As You Like It," because um, there were people who had a very visceral reaction to that play, to going to see what they thought was Shakespeare, um, and then got a solo play. Um, that was very uncomfortable for them because they thought they were going to see some nice Shakespeare as you like it. Everybody likes to play that sort of thing. Um, and people stood up and shouted in, in the theater, people left loudly. There were very visceral, loud reactions, uh, not ironically or unexpectedly, mostly from, uh, nice white people who'd gone to see the show. Um, do you expect that kind of, are you, are you ready for that kind of reaction with this show? Yeah, I, I, I'm definitely ready for people to, uh, I'm ready for people to sort of come away from it feeling very upset and very disturbed and very, cause I mean, we're dealing with, you know, apart from, apart from examining, you know, racial politics, which is always, always uncomfortable territory. Um, you know, you're also dealing with, you're also dealing with the deaths of children, which is that that will and you're dealing with grief, you're dealing with, you know, parental loss. I mean, these are all things that are very, very hard to sit with for, for anybody. And uh, so I, I think that's a very the play contains a very kind of potent mix of un, of uncomfortable, difficult things that audiences are going to have to are going to have to sit with. And I, you know, I don't want to, and I'm very much aware of that. I was aware of that when I first started writing it. And I don't want them to, I don't want the play to be entirely devoid of, you know, of heart or humor because of that. In fact, I want to make sure that those elements are very present. I want to make sure that these are characters that, you know, even the even the unlovable characters in this you you find something that you can that you you find something to which you can emotionally connect in their in their situation and so i i hope that will carry people through i'm also not you know I, i'm i'm also resorting to a bit of a different approach from uh uh than cliff cardinal i'm not trying to sort of surprise people or startle them or or kind of spring anything on them so i think that will i think i think that also makes it a little bit easier to to sell it to people like you know exactly what you're gonna get when you come sure i think i think sometimes people people think they know what they're gonna get and then when they get what they what they what they were gonna get but maybe it's a little different they react to it or maybe they 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 people have Theater goers are strange and we live in a, in a strange time, this pandemic time when we're sort of like poking our heads out and maybe it's post pandemic and who knows what, what it's what people are kind of relearning how to be in the world. And some people are not doing it very well. Um, yeah, it's, 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 it's difficult because like you said, it's, it's a very different, different thing than say the, the Cliff Cardinal situation. But again, um, uh, it's, it's, People are going to have a visceral reaction and, and they should, that's what theater is for. It's to have people react. The worst thing is when somebody leaves and say, well, that was nice. You know, that's a non answer. Um, I had a thought and I've lost it. So um, that's, <laughs> that's the thing that happens. 
It'll come back. It'll come back to you. Maybe it will. Maybe it will. Maybe it won't. Maybe it wasn't a good question after all. Um, one of the things that, oh, I was thinking about, about, you know, the, the need for humor. And I think sometimes I've, I think we've all seen this play. that's very serious, but forgets to add the humor. Mm -hmm. Um, and we need it. We need it in order to release tension. You can build the tension, but there needs to be a release. We need that in any play, whether it's tragedy, whether it's revenge, com whether it's revenge tragedy, whatever it is, we laugh during the, the the tension. We need it because otherwise it's just it's just too much. You look at the the darkest plays, um, and and after a moment of of, of of sadness or anger, you're laughing a moment later. Um, as a writer. Um, how do you find the comedic moments for yourself in, in serious topics? How do you do that without deflating uh, the seriousness of the situation? Yeah, it's a, it's a tricky balancing act to pull off um, because there's, there's two kinds of laughter for me that you can, you can kind of evoke in audiences. There's comfortable laughter that kind of affirms uh, that, that kind of soothes and and affirms, you know, established thought. And you can kind of just, you can sort of lean back into it. It's very, uh, you know, it, it's, it's very non-threatening. And then there's uncomfortable laughter, which really throws you for a loop because you're not expecting, you're just, you're not expecting the, you're not expecting the play to go there. You're not expecting it to kind of uh, be this irreverent about something so heavy or serious or potentially controversial. And it just, it like completely throws you back in your seat. And it's like a bucket of cold water poured on your face. Um, I love those moments. And I love, I love experiencing those moments as an audience member. And I love, uh, I love evoking those moments. It's, it's tricky because you have to be able to do it in a way that, I mean, you have to be very clear in what your targets are, I find. Because, I mean, the the risk, you know, like every everyone who writes satire is, you know, they don't necessarily intend to offend people. That's not their goal. Their goal is to entertain people. But we all know that, we all know that we run that risk. And so you have to kind of go according to your own internal ethical barometer of, of good sense and good taste um, in deciding where you want to, what moments you want to kind of destabilize the audience and, and throw them for a loop. Um, mm -hmm. But it's uh, the, the end result when you get people, you know, when you get people laughing and, and then wondering why they're laughing. I mean, to me, that's, those are some of the moments that I, I live for the most in theater. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Satire is very different, as we know from, I don't know, people sharing the Beaverton on, on Facebook or the Onion. Um, I remember a few years ago, um, uh, CBC, uh, a fake news program, satire, satir satirical news program, had a, uh, an episode about the Ontario government banning breakfast sandwiches. And if you came in and you didn't know that you were listening to a, a satirical program, it sounds like a news program. And I know people who heard that show and were raging about it. And they, we, we, we talked about it. It's like, that's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. And then hearing a rerun of that program, realizing that you're listening to satire and feeling like an idiot. So <laughs> satire is, is, is both fun and difficult to do. Um, and it's also difficult because it, out of context, it, it, it can be, out of context by certain people, it can be used as a tool, right? By like, here's an article out of context. How terrible is this? Um, now, fortunately, with theater, we don't often have that taken out of context because we're, you know, it, it, it exists in a moment, right? It exists in a moment. It's not something that, that people are particularly reading or sharing in that way. Um, as far as satire goes, what is your current favorite source of satire? Ooh. <laughs> uh, my current favorite source of satire, I would have to, I'd have to name a couple. I'd have to name a few because there's, there's just so many uh, going back from, you know, the comedies of Aristophanes to the writings of Swift to, uh, 
you know, two two of my favorite movies. One is Doctor Strange Love, the classic uh, Kubrick uh, satire on uh, on nuclear war and our propensity to create systems that will eventually that if left unchecked will eventually destroy us all. Um, and there's another movie by uh, a, by the Greek filmmaker Costa Gavras called Z. I don't know if you've seen it. It's a uh, it's a movie from I. I again i believe from the 70s it uh won the oscar for best foreign language film it's uh and it takes place in greece at around the time when uh it, it's it centers around the assassination of a left wing political leader um and you find out later that it's 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 sort of it's paced like a thriller and you find out that it's um the people that were connected to the assassination are connected to the military and it's a it's part of this this coup that's taking place, and mm. uh, for you know right wing fascism to uh, to sort of rise up and and control the population in in Greece. And I mean, the country's not named, but it's very it's very clear that Costa Gavras is writing about his own his own country of origin. Mm. And uh, the way that it's the way that it all unfolds, there's this undercurrent of re- of bleak and and savage irony. You know, as he uncovers the layers and layers of corruption in, you know, the judicial system and the police system. And sometimes it's I, I heard I was listening to one and I, I was listening to one analysis of the film that put it very well. Sometimes the best way to do satire is to just reveal the truth and let it mock itself. And um, that uh, I, it was that approach that I really kind of wanted to employ for blood offering because mm-hmm. the the premise the premise of the play is very satirical in a very kind of modest proposal sort of way but it unfolds like a tragedy because you know you want the because i've you know i i found this in earlier drafts of the play you know if that human element is not there if that sort of you know if we don't feel the emotional devastation of what's going on then audiences are going to tune out pretty quickly Mm. because when it's done poorly satire can be very didactic and preachy and that's that's not what i wanted to do here sure absolutely absolutely um you mentioned just sort of a little earlier that um you came you 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 came to ottawa back to ottawa uh, from the West Coast just before the pandemic. Now, was the pandemic what brought you back from the West Coast or did was that a unfortunate timing kind of thing? It was very unfortunate timing. Um, yeah, my partner and I came back in uh, late 2019 um, for basically for a bunch of different reasons, healthcare reasons and uh, financial reasons. And uh, we just thought it would be best to come back. And so we were just, uh, you know, we were settling into our lives here when, yeah, COVID hit and mm-hmm. that changed everything. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, were you working on anything at the time that, that, that the pandemic hit? Was something, was anything interrupted for you? Um, I was, uh, well, I'd been working on a, a, a couple of different things. Um, one of which is a play that uh, actually I, I just had a reading at, um, the Undercurrents Festival here in Ottawa, they have an event called New Play Tuesday. And uh, we did a staged reading of it one night. It's called White Lion, Brown Tiger. And um, that takes place, that is very explicitly a Canadian play in contrast to this. Um, it takes place in a thrift shop in Victoria uh, where a fight breaks out between two Sri Lankan employees and their white manager tries to diffuse the tension between them. And it becomes this exploration about, you know, identity and heritage and lasting trauma from the Sri Lankan civil war. And um, again, very, very much, very much like blood offering tonally. It's, you know, very political, very uh, darkly funny and ironic. And, uh, but also with, but also with a fair amount of, of heart as well. So yeah, I, Mm. uh, yeah, that's the, that was what I was working on at the time I came back. Yeah. And Blood Offering was kind of a 10 minute play that I'd kind of put to the side. I didn't know what I was going to do with it. I didn't know if it was going to blossom into something else the way it has. But uh, it's funny the way things turn out, you know? 
Was it something that was it a project that you started like that you turned to uh, when everything was shut during the pandemic that you decided like I guess the challenge is to expand this into something like what how did the, how did the writing of it come about from the ten minute play to to what it's become now? Yeah, so I um, yeah I was just looking at uh, different plays that I had uh, I had started working on or that I that I'd had you know first drafts finished and I was uh, and I thought you know which of these can be which of these can I really turn into something that when all of this is over will be worthy of being put on stage? That's what I was like. That's what I was doing. Cause I was like, okay, if I'm stuck in my apartment, then I'm going to, I'm going to use that time to really like build up a body of work and really, you know, create some things that are going to be that are really going to have a profound visceral effect on people when they're finally staged and and this was one of them i read it again and i just thought you know uh there's a lot that can be explored here and there's a lot that can be elaborated upon and a lot that can be dramatized that can't be touched on in just 10 minutes so no absolutely absolutely um during those early days of the pandemic, back when, you know, first we thought, oh, two weeks and this will all be over. And then six weeks and then it'll all be over. Um, did you were you able to write during that period? Because I know for myself as a writer, I spent quite a bit of time unable to write in the first six months of the pandemic. Just sort of like all I could do was doom scroll and I didn't have the creativity in me. It came eventually, but for quite a while before that, it was, it was not possible. Did you find any kind of block in the whole bleakness of, of everything or were you able to, to write during that time? If, you know, if anything, it was the opposite for me. I found that like I had to, I had to write, I had to be working on something to kind of just focus on a project, you know, for the sake of just distracting myself from everything that was going on, because it really felt like, you know, the world was, the world was coming to an end, or I guess an accelerated end. And it just became, but, but even that wasn't necessarily a, a positive thing for me uh, uh, all the time, because it felt like, you know, because I didn't know, because this was in the days when we didn't know we didn't really know about the effects of COVID. We didn't know what it was going to do to people. And I didn't know, like, if I get this virus, like, is that it for me? Am I just going to, am I just going to die? Is that going to be it? So I thought, you know, if that's the case, then I have to really like, I have to, I have to like finish this work and I have to get it out there so that, you know, sounds a bit egotistical perhaps, but like in the event that I, this thing kills me. Like I'll have left something behind that, you know, is worth preserving. Um, I don't, I don't think that sounds so egotistical. Sort of a, I think that's the, I think that's the artist's urge, right? That's the artist's like, like, especially writers. Like you do this writers, painters, actors, if you're on st in theater, a little less so, but still you're leaving behind a body of work, right? You're trying to find like, in some ways, this is how you're remembered you know yeah. uh, by by the creation so uh, i think that it, it it maybe it's egotistical but you know i think we all have it we all have that kind of that kind of thing um as far as uh, as as writing and theater in general what is it that brought you to the theater we all have our origin stories as as theater creators as theater artists uh, what's yours? What is it that made you first want to do theater? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it's always been a part of my life from when I was a kid, you know, my, my mom signed me up for drama classes and, uh, and I thought it was, but I wasn't like serious about it then necessarily. Like I thought it, it was a fun activity for me, but I didn't think it was necessarily going to be my calling until until I got to high school, because my school, I was fortunate enough to go to a school that had a very strong drama program. And I remember in grade nine, I, uh, my drama class basically kind of had to collectively write a play together. And we all, and we, as actors, we kind of wrote the scenes that we were directly involved in. And I remember it was about, um, it was about a kid who 
who's had a kind of a troubled home life. His parents fought all the time and he had nightmares. And, you know, we like, we use like shadow puppetry to like, you know, put to like show the, you know, all the bad dreams he was having. And, and I played the kid's dad. So I wrote all the scenes with, uh, all the scenes with him and the kid's mom who were fighting all the time. And, uh, it was funny. Um, I, when it finally premiered, when, when we had, you know, all the parents came to see it and everything, um, they were, it was funny because they were all laughing at several moments and I didn't, I wasn't necessarily thinking of that when I was writing those scenes, I was like, oh, I, you know, that's interesting. <laughs> like I was, I meant it to be very, like very serious and this is, you know, this is very dramatic and very intense, but I, I don't know if they were laughing because of like my writing or if it was because, they were laughing because they were looking at kids trying to imitate adults. But um, it was a very, it was a very interesting moment for me because I thought like, because I heard that and I thought, oh, like these are, this is the effect that my words can have on people. You know, what's the contents of my head are, are now being acted out for a bunch of people. And I thought that was just the most, incredible thing and the most magical thing and i that was when because i knew i wanted to write but i didn't necessarily know what direction i wanted to go in that was when i knew i wanted to be a playwright one of the things uh, i think that that we all who who write in the theater or work in the theater like create in the theater there's a moment you know there's that moment where we figure out oh um i want to you could do this as a as a calling this can be a career um then you have to break it to people and figure out how that's going to happen. Um, you have to go to guidance counselors and, and tell them that you want to work in theater and have them try to figure out what that means. Cause they weren't expecting that. You know, I remember my guidance counselor uh, didn't have any resources for me. So I had to figure it out on my own. Cause they were like, uh, I don't know anything about that. So oh. it was, that was on my own. Um, what was, what was your journey to like, becoming like deciding that this is what you were going to do and getting there. Um, yeah, it's, I guess, uh, well, once I, once I graduated high school, I kind of went on a bit of a, I kind of went on a bit of a zigzag because I thought initially like maybe I'll do, maybe I'll do something a little bit more, um, a little bit safer, I suppose, a little bit more conventional, and then do my writing on the side. So I signed, I, I got accepted to the liberal arts program at Marianopolis, and that, and then it took me only a couple of months to decide, like, no, actually, I can't just, I can't just sit in, it, it was when I, it was, it was when I knew that academia was not so much for me. I needed to actually be on the ground, creating, making art, um, instead of just talking about it. So I, I switched to uh, creative, the creative arts program at Dawson College. And uh, I did, uh, you know, I was part of a group called the Dawson Theatre Collective. And that really only cemented my desire to, to try and forge something of a career in this path. And uh, I, and then I got accepted to the playwriting program at Concordia, and I got to specialize even more um, and you know, the good thing about that, pro that program about, I think theater programs and universities in general is they give you a, a platform in which you can just, you can just test out a whole bunch of ideas and you don't have to worry about, you know, cause in the professional world, you have to worry about, you know, getting grants and you have to worry about breaking even and with box office and all that stuff. But in school, you don't have to, you can just try stuff and not worry about, you know, the consequences of failing. You can fail all you want. Um, and in the process, you can figure out just what kind of a writer you want to be, what, what, what your focus is, what your concerns are. So, yeah, I mean, I'm lucky I had people who really kind of supported me on that journey and who were really able to kind of, uh, yeah, just help me figure out who I was. Yeah. Yeah. Now, as a as a fan of you know, speculative fiction, science fiction, fantasy and horror um, and now for the longest time, 
genre was something that in, that it seems like in Canadian theater and maybe theater at large in recent years we have avoided. There was a time when horror happened on stage. You had Jekyll and Hyde in the Victorian era. Era you had Dracula as a, as a play. Uh, uh, terrifying people in the Victorian era, and then we we did movies, and then people were like, "Well, I guess theater isn't 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 uh, scary anymore, isn't isn't uh, fantastic anymore, fantastical." Um, but over the last few years, I've noticed more groups and more writers and more creators starting to to dabble in the 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 sci fi and the the, the fantasy. For you, what's the importance of of of, of genre theater uh, on our stages? What does it bring that that say uh, a non genre theater doesn't? Uh, well, I think that you know, especially with science fiction. I mean, you have the potential to you have the potential to completely remake the world on stage, um, and kind of show people alternate ways of being. I'll give you an example of that. Um, At the Great Canadian Theatre Company, where I work in the box office, we just closed a run of uh, Yvette Nolan's wonderful play, The Unplugging, which takes place during a post-apocalyptic future where uh, two elderly Indigenous women have been banished from their community for you know, being being too old, being past childbearing age. So they're, they're thrown out. And... They find they they use they're eventually able to use their their traditional knowledge their knowledge of the land to survive on their own and kind of create a, their own sort of matriarchal society of two, and they're and then eventually somebody from the community try uh, goes out to find them and tries to entice them into coming back and it's sort of it gets us to think about you know what you know it gets us to think about different ways of cooperation and you know as opposed to competition it gets us to think about uh our relationship to nature and the land it gets us to think about uh you know how we it gets us to think about how we treat the elderly in ways that you know a a, re, a completely quote unquote realistic story set in our own time might not be able to do so you know one of the I mean one of the greatest things about science fiction fantasy horror is that there are you know there are no walls there are no there's there's no rules associated with these genres you can do anything you want you can set it in any kind of world that you want and the thing is too I think a very popular misconception about speculative fiction in theater is that I think people tend to shy away from it because they think it requires really big budget fancy effects the way that Hollywood movies and, and television have shown us. And really all you need is you can, you can do as much. You can tell a story that is as mind blowing and thought provoking with just, you know, a couple of people and a chair. That's all you really need. Um, and I think that, uh, I mean, I'm certainly trying to, I'm trying to add to that with that sort of growing canon with my own work. I mean, I'm working on a play right now, which is about, uh, a young, you know, Sri Lankan Canadian technical writer who works for an arms manufacturing firm. And he has a special power. Well, he has two powers, uh, one of which is that he is unable to feel pain, but he can transfer it to the nearest living individual. And the other is that he heals. So he's basically invincible. And he has to, when he's outed by one of his coworkers, he has to decide whether he wants to sell his DNA to he wants to let the company he works for sell his DNA to uh, the Saudi Arabian army, which again is a commentary on, you know, Canada's complicity in various human rights abuses around the globe. So there's, you know, it's, you can kind of use this, these sort of imaginative tools to comment on, on, you know, larger social injustices and, you can use that for dystopian or utopian ends. It's it's there's so we're just now waking up to the idea that there's there's so much you can do with genre fiction in theater. And I I'm really I'm I want to do everything I can to like push that forward and to sort of facilitate the the growth of uh of essentially a new kind of theater, a theater that looks to the future instead of just the present and the past. 
I think it's fascinating that we are coming back to to the genre aspect of it, which was gone for so long. Uh, you know, like I like I mentioned, but more and more people are starting to to dabble in it because you can say things without having to say them. Allegory is so common in in the genre and actually in, in many ways more effective than, than like just coming out and saying, this is a play about, about something important. You could sort of like hide your important thing and somebody in the middle of the play will go, Oh, and suddenly realize what you're talking about. And also the thing that I love about theater is that you like, like you were mentioning, um, people imagine more in the theater than they do when they're in, in a, watching a movie or watching television. If you tell people that we're now on another planet as you, they will be like, okay, so now we're on another planet. Like you can do, you can suggest it with maybe lights with maybe something else, but the, the audience is more likely to just go along with it in a way that they're not going to, if it's a movie or a, or, or, or TV. Exactly. Yeah. It, it calls upon people to, because theater relies so much on suggestion as opposed to like, you know, and if, if it's a movie or a TV show, you can you can use CGI and practical effects to like show that you're on another planet. And OK, we just buy it instantly. But, you know, with a lit with maybe a minimal set, you kind of you're asking the audience to sort of. Yeah, it's a greater uh, it's a greater suspension of disbelief that you're asking of them. But once they agree to go on that journey, it's 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 so much more re rewarding, I think, because you're using your imagination and you have a role in, in creating the piece as well, in a way. Absolutely. I always, I always, I've had people, you know, I work with people in my day job who are not theater people. And so for them, they wonder like, what's the big deal with theater? And I always give two examples, like, or one main example, like if you're, if you watch a movie or a TV show and somebody gets slapped, you don't react to that. But if you're in a theater and you're watching that and somebody gets slapped, everybody always reacts to that because it's happening right there. It's physical. It's 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 in the same room. And so suddenly things become more immediate, which is a fascinating thing to explore in those differences. Um, now, just sort of in closing, I want to talk briefly about um, the Ottawa storytellers and, 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 and how you work with them. Uh, tell me about 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 what you what you do with Ottawa Storytellers. Yeah, so um, well, I'm a, I'm I my involvement with them began uh, in I think 2021 or thereabouts when um, I saw a call circulating around that they were looking for storytellers to participate in a digital video series called Stories in 180, and uh, that that's a series that's you know it's continued on into a second season now and uh you can find uh you can find recordings of it on youtube i have uh, a couple of traditional buddhist stories that i've retold for both seasons and uh that was a lot of fun it allowed me to kind of um it allowed me to kind of access a part of my imagination that um hadn't necessarily been explored up to that point i hadn't really dabbled that much in oral storytelling um, and I just think it's so cool that there's a group that's dedicated to keeping that that art form alive, probably the oldest art form in existence, you know, and uh, it's and it encompasses so many different things. You know, they tell did they do revivals of fairy tales and folk tales and myths and epics? They also do. Uh, but they're also dedicated to, like, you know, telling personal stories and, you know, uh, you know, sort of turning the contents of your own life into into performative art and um and i've found that through them i've been able to sort of um well i've been able to explore my own fascination with myths and legends and uh the ancient epics of the past and uh and trying to sort of update those stories and bring them into into the present um you know i think it's very uh i think it's a really intriguing exercise to be able to do that. And also I think um, it's allowed me to sort of renew my commitment to, you know, committing stories to memory, which I think is an art that we, I think that we've kind of lost. And I think that as we move towards, 
you know, as the world we live in grows more and more precarious and we don't necessarily know if our way of life is going to last into the centuries to come, I think that's a skill that more of us might want to try and pick up. Hmm. Yeah, you're, you're right about that for sure. Now, just in closing, I want to talk about blood offering in performance and uh, 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 people seeing that. I believe it's it's going to be seen in Toronto. What, Where and when uh, will we be able to see it in Toronto? Yes, I know it's, it's going up at York University. It is going up at the end of April. I believe the performance dates are... Uh, let me just double check. <laughs> um, I believe they are April 28th and 29th. Um, you'll be able to see it. Uh, so yeah, you'll be able to see it in exactly a month. Nice. Awesome. Um, will you be there? Will you be, be seeing it in performance? And will this be your yes. first time seeing it in performance? It will be, yes. And I'm super excited to see the uh, to see the actors bring it to life. It's going to be truly wonderful awesome well Vishesh thank you so much for, for, for joining me uh, I really appreciate you taking the time thank you so much I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to to be able to talk about this and other things it was great meeting you too for the good first to meet time. you this has been an episode of Stage Worthy Stageworthy is produced, hosted, and edited by Phil Rickaby. That's me. If you enjoyed this podcast and you listen on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, you can leave a five-star rating. And if you listen on Apple Podcasts, you can also leave a review. Those reviews and ratings help new people find the show. If you want to keep up with what's going on with Stageworthy and my other projects, you can subscribe to my newsletter by going to philrickaby.com slash subscribe. And remember... If you want to leave a tip, you'll find a link to the virtual tip jar in the show notes or on the website. You can find Stageworthy on Twitter and Instagram at StageworthyPod, and you can find the website with the complete archive of all episodes at stageworthy.ca. If you want to find me, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Phil Rickaby, and as I mentioned, my website is philrickaby.com. See you next week for another episode of Stageworthy. Stageworthy.